The Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Now, before we get started, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Arti Nair is a postdoctoral fellow with the UCLA Almondson Loveless Brain Mapping Center and the UCLA Pierce Clinic at the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior. Her primary research interests lie in multimodal imaging studies of social cognition and autism. She is also a clinical neuropsychology fellow in the Medical Psychology Assessment Center. These webinars are made possible through donor support, including a generous grant from local 25 Boston Teamsters. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.com. Great, thank you, Denise. So today I'm going to be talking about the uh, strategies for handling teasing, bullying, that in includes physical bullying and cyberbullying um, that we use as part of our UCLA Peers program for um, youth with autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. So just to give you a little background about peers before we begin, this is an international program that was developed at UCLA in 2004. Um, it started out with a program for teens, so the adolescent program, um, that now has been translated into over a dozen languages and it's being used in over 25 countries. Um, some of them are just translations and then others are actual adaptations to the, um, the culture in question. So for example, we have this manual up here that is the cultural adaptation uh, created by collaborators in South Korea. We also have evidence-based social skills programs for preschoolers and for young adults in addition to our adolescent groups. So here are the manuals that we use for our teen groups. There's the young adult one. We have one that's for teens that's being used um, in school. So it's meant to be used by school-based professionals, um, slightly different format, but same sort of uh, set of skills that are being covered in all of our other groups. And then we have a parent uh, uh, book that is really helpful for parents guiding their uh, teens and young adults through social challenges as well as a phone app, which is called the Friend Maker app that has all of our role play videos, as well as um, just the steps and the rules that we have our participants follow along with. So before we talk about um, the actual strategies for handling teasing and bullying, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the consequences of peer rejection in our youth with autism spectrum disorders. So typically, we sort of see two sets of um, youth in our program, one that's peer rejected and one that's socially neglected. So the peer rejected youth tend to become victims of teasing or bullying. They tend to have bad reputations at uh, school for maybe speaking out of turn or um, interrupting or just, you know, a set of poor social skills. Um, they tend to actively seek out peers. So the, you know, they are really interested in uh, making friends and connecting with their peers, but might be um, attempting some misguided steps in doing so, which is why they end up with, end up being rejected or with bad reputations. And what we usually see is, um, this group of you tend to have diagnoses such as ADHD or mood disorders or impulse control disorders like um, OCD, for example. Then we have um, the socially neglected group, which is a group of teens that tend to be more isolated and socially withdrawn. They kind of are just, you know, um, wallflowers, right? Like they're in the background, uh, mostly ignored or unnoticed by their peers. They're usually avoiding their peers because, you know, it's really anxiety provoking for them probably or um, fear of rejection or so that uh, prevents them from trying to even make attempts to connect with their peers. And so in turn, their peers are also, um, for the most part, uh, uh, kind of just ignoring them. Um, what we see in this group of youth is comorbid diagnosis of anxiety or depression.
So what are the consequences of peer rejection? So this is one of the strongest predictors of eventual mental health problems, especially anxiety and depression. Um, it can also be a pretty strong predictor of juvenile delinquency. So engaging in risk-taking behaviors for whatever reason, you know, they might be, uh, be put up by um, their peers to do something, to do some kind of risky thing that, um, you know, they're more inclined to because they're so interested in being accepted by their peers um, and are not necessarily able to make good distinctions between what are good peers and what aren't, what are the peers that would uh, misguide you. And we also see a lot of early withdrawal from school uh, due to peer rejection. Other consequences of peer rejection include, as we mentioned already, mental health um, difficulties, including depression and anxiety, a great sense of loneliness, um, low self-esteem because of being um, avoided or rejected by their peers, um, also correlates with eventual substance abuse, uh, poor academic performance, and not only suicidal ideation, but also, unfortunately, more suicide attempts. So just specifically looking at autism, uh, teens with autism spectrum disorder, uh, we find that they are nine times more likely to experience peer victimization than non-disabled peers. So that's a pretty staggering statistic. They're really at high risk for some of these um, unfortunate teen conflict situations. 94% um, of our teens with autism spectrum disorders report um, experiencing some sort of peer victimization just in the previous year. So just even in our clinic, we hear this a lot. We are teasing and bullying to be one of the most persistent complaints amongst our youth. Teens with ASD and comorbid ADHD are compared to their uh, compared to the teens that have ASD and not ADHD are four times more likely to engage in bullying behavior themselves. So that is a pretty um, large number of this specific group of comorbid diagnosis. Um, teens with ASD without the ADHD do not tend to differ, differ from their typically developing peers in rates of engaging in bullying behavior. This we again see as another misguided attempt to be accepted. You know, um, they're trying to be accepted by the bullies, uh, maybe to avoid being bullied themselves or, you know, the bullies seem to be like sometimes the popular kids. So want, our kids with ADHD want to be accepted by them. So they um, are more likely to engage in some of these bullying behaviors. Risk factors for peer rejection amongst um, our teens with ASD. So the high risk factors are, you know, um, being less socially competent, having fewer friendships and having less peer support. So um, what we find is that, you know, having even one friendship, uh, one supportive friendship, someone that can stick up for you in some of these situations are um, really protective against um, being victimized or being rejected by your peers. Uh, so this is kind of a, a statistical analysis that we gathered, just national sample across the country of uh, the categories of peer acceptance in teens in schools. So, you know, when we ask our um, teens in the groups, about how many people do they think are actually popular amongst their peers, they'll say like 50% or 75% because to them, it seems like everyone apart from themselves is popular. So uh, when we actually look at the stats, so you can see for the most part, of, um, as might be expected, um, the average rating of peer acceptance. So that's, you know, having had experiences of rejection, having had some ex uh, uh, positive experiences of acceptance is the largest category. So we see that as being uh, right here, this 55% group have had mixed experiences. The popular group in contrast is only about 15% of teens really, which is pretty similar to the same amount of teens that we see being peer rejected 
and socially neglected. So this is something we always present to our teens to kind of normalize, you know, the rate of rejections or social errors they might make. But the point is to keep trying and trying better strategies to being accepted by their peers. So before we go on to the actual strategies, let's talk a little bit about what the different types of bullying are. So, um, you know, bullying, we look at bullying as a subtype of aggression. So that could be any type of negative action directed at a student or a group of students that are either repetitive, chronic, and they're characterized by a power imbalance. So it's usually, you know, they tend to victimize people that are by themselves. So there's also a power imbalance just in terms of sheer number of, um, of groups. Bullying behaviors can take on a ver variety of forms that includes physical bullying. So I think this is something we always uh, think of when we're talking about bullying is the physical aggression. And that could involve physical aggression towards them, or it could be, you know, throwing things around, like just being physically aggressive around the victim as well. Um, then there's verbal bullying, which we refer to as teasing in our groups. So this is another uh, type of bullying that people will lump together under this category. We try to separate it out as teasing because um, the strategies, as I will talk about, are a bit different to handle each type. Then there's relational bullying, which is things that can happen, you know, within friendships or um, you know, probably not the best sort of friendships, but it does happen. It happens a lot more in high school, which includes things like spreading rumors or gossip about someone and kind of socially excluding or ostracizing them due to that gossip. And then there's the electronic uh, bullying, cyberbullying, trolling, several different terms, but this has become you know, something that's uh, very pervasive across schools since most teens are on social media and social media does tend to give people a platform to anonymously attack the victims that they want to. So first we're going to talk about verbal teasing. So that is, um, you know, saying mean things to kids or calling them names or um, deliberately trying to embarrass them in front of their peers. So we start out by questioning what are most children and teens told to do in response to teasing. And the, re the response we get for this type of question for the most part is, you know, adults will tell them to ignore it, to um, walk away, to s say stop, go tell an adult. That's typically the advice that teens get. But what do most children and teens with autism spectrum disorders do in response to teasing? Um, they most likely tend to get upset. They get really upset. They might cry or um, fight back or, um, you know, sometimes they might even try to tease back, which does not always go very well. So these are not um, really behaviors that help in reducing the likelihood of them becoming victims again in the future. So the rules for handling teasing as we teach our teens is actually not to walk away, ignore the person or tell an adult. That is all the advice that they typically get. And why is that? Because walking away, ignoring the person or telling an adult doesn't really help um, make the teasing go away. So walking away, ignoring makes them actually look weak. So what we found from our research is that they tend to still get teased, like the teaser will chase them and tease them and will keep doing it because um, the victim comes across as being weak. Telling an adult can be really problematic because especially if the teaser finds out that you told an adult, then you kind of get a reputation for being a tattletale or a snitch and um, it makes the teaser angry. So they are more likely to tease them again in the future. We first want them to start out by not showing that they are upset and definitely not by teasing back. Um, teasing back again would provoke the teaser further so then you're just going to go back and forth, back and forth, and it's not gonna really stop. And our, our teens with ASD are really not that great at teasing back. 
um, but it really is important for them to start out by showing that they're not upset um, because the, the really what, what the teaser is looking for a reaction. So becoming upset is the reaction that they want. And so, you know, we want to make sure we're not giving them the reaction that they want so that it's not fun for them to tease. Then we want them to act like what the person said did not bother them. So they're keeping cool. They're not getting upset. They're acting like the person or whatever the person said did not bother them. Okay. After that, we want them to provide a short comeback that shows whatever the person said was actually pretty lame. So this is the list of comebacks that we usually give them. So you things like saying whatever, big deal. And your point is, or is that supposed to be funny? They can also do nonverbal things like shrug their shoulders, roll their eyes. Again, not everyone's very good at this. So we want to make sure if that if they try to adopt eye rolling or shoulder shrugging, we have them actually go around and demonstrate what that looks like. Because if it doesn't look like a casual eye roll, then again, they're going to be targeted further for something that stands out as being odd or weird. And we wouldn't want that to happen to them. So we usually suggest that they pick three comebacks because the person is not going to tease them once, hear a comeback, and then stop immediately. They're going to try a couple of times. So they just need to be prepared with like two or three of these comebacks um, to go with it. And then what they need to do is walk away or remove, this, remove themselves from the situation after they've given the comebacks. Um, they don't need to be standing there letting the person continue going on teasing them. Okay. Another question we get is, what if they want to come up with their own comebacks? And we usually, what we say is that that's risky because we do not know what these teens will come up with. They might not be short, for one, and they might not actually be great comebacks. They might be comebacks that sound like they're upset or they're bothered by it, which is really um, going against the purpose of these comebacks. So we usually tell them that it's really risky to come up with something else because we don't know if that's going to work or not. Our research has shown that these comebacks on this list work, so we suggest that they stick to these comebacks. So let's watch the first role play here, and we're going to see how, what um, Alina, our actor, does right in handling the teasing in this situation. So think about what Alina is doing right as you're watching it. Man, Alina, those are some ugly shoes. Whatever. Whatever, I would be caught dead in those. Those are nasty. Is that supposed to be funny? I don't know if it's supposed to be funny, but those are not cute. Anyway. All right, so then we go into our perspective taking questions with um, the teens here after they watch the role play. So first we'll go over what did Alina do right? And they'll say, well, she didn't, she kept her cool. She didn't look too bothered. She definitely didn't seem upset. She kind of looked at um, the other, uh, the teaser as um, being really lame. Like, what, why is this interesting to you? Was sort of her facial expression and reactions. And uh, and then after she gave a few comebacks, she walked away. She didn't continue standing there, taking more teasing coming her way. So then we ask um, um, the group, what was that like for the other person? And they might say, well, you know, it wasn't really fun because she wasn't getting the reactions that um, she wants or that she might be used to getting from Alina. Then we'll ask, what did they, what did she think of Alina? And they'll usually say, well, she thought Alina didn't really seem affected by the teasing. She really wasn't bothered. Um, again, Alina may think that she's kind of lame for teasing. And then we ask them, would she want to tease Alina again? And then this is a tricky question because she probably doesn't want to tease Alina right now after this um, incident because it left her looking kind of lame. But... Um, is she likely to do it again? Probably, she's used to getting a certain reaction from Alina, so she might try a few times. And then if, so the key here really is persistence. So if you persistently stick with not being affected, giving the comebacks, it's not gonna be fun for the teaser. She's not going to, at some point she's gonna stop teasing. 
in a year, maybe she'll think back and be like, you know what? It used to be really fun to tease Alina. I'm going to try again. And she may try that again. But as long as Alina sticks to her comebacks and she sticks to her reactions, um, it's it's unlikely that she's going to be um, a victim uh, for very long or uh, persistently in this situation. So what we have our group do after that is go around the room. We have them all practice the comebacks. We usually tease them about something that's not related to their appearance. So like shoes, clothing, that's fine um, because it's not, you know, about the way like they look physically, for example. So it's not very upsetting for them. Um, and they pick their favorite comebacks, practice it. We practice the nonverbal shrugging. As you see, Alina did some eye rolling. She did some shoulder shrugging. Girls tend to be better than boys at doing things like that, just more naturally. But we um, want to make sure our teens who want to do that are able to get some feedback on how they look when they do that. So moving on next, we're going to talk about physical bullying. So again, what are most teens told to do in response to physical bullying? For the most part, again, a lot of the reactions are um, to say, you know, ignore it, walk away. Sometimes we get, um, you know, teens do get the advice to fight back. And um, that is a tricky one, again, because we do get asked by teens, well, what if I just fight back? And it can actually be effective to fight back but it's not going to reduce bullying in the future. So we are personally not allowed to let them know that, um, you know, that they should fight back. But um, if they are getting advice like that from a parent or another adult, we just say it's risky. It's risky because um, it's not going to actually stop the physical bullying in the future. It's just going to be like a vicious cycle of fighting and fighting back and fighting and fighting back. And so again, we go on to ask, what do most teens with ASD do in response to physical bullying? Again, they get upset. They might try to fight back. They usually tend to go tell an adult, which is also not um, the best first step in this situation. So let's look at what might be the um, steps to avoid physical bullying. So the first thing we ask them to do is to avoid the bully as much as possible. So just kind of stay out of the reach of the bully, Basically, if the bully can't find you, he can't bully you. So the way you can go about doing that is planning your route. So if you know that the bully tends to hang out in um, a certain space on campus or, um, you know, if they, you know where their locker is, for example, you know what, what time they might be around there, you try to avoid those regions. So you plan your route to class and back um, such that you're not crossing the bully. Um, in their usual hangout areas. Then we ask them to lay low when the bully is around. So that means not drawing too much attention to themselves. So again, if the bully doesn't notice you, he won't bully you, right? So don't try to be funny. Don't try to be like the jokester or um, do things that are attention seeking sort of behaviors when the bully is around because then you're going to draw attention to yourself from this person. We definitely don't want them to provoke the bully. So we don't want them, for example, to be using the strategies for teasing with the bully. So if the bully is teasing you, probably don't give the comebacks because that's going to provoke the bully further and then they're just going to physically attack you. Okay, so we definitely don't want them to be also teasing the bully. Things include uh, that go in hand in hand with provoking the bully. Uh, we advise them not to police the bully. So that's like telling them about uh, telling on the bully for minor offenses um, or like correcting their grammar, for example. So just don't police the bully. Don't um, make them um, get annoyed or angry or upset at you. We def and, uh, and if someone if the bully is vic uh, victimizing someone else and uh, we advise our teens to discreetly tell an adult if someone else is in danger. So don't try to intervene yourself if you're a, another victim of the bully because then they're just going to bully you. Instead, discreetly go and tell a safe adult, like a teacher at school or um, the staff there, uh, but as discreetly as possible. Okay. 
we don't don't want them to be making friends with the bully a lot of our teens try this because they think if they're going to be friends with the bully the bully is not going to attack them and that's really not true that's actually going to you know being friends with the bully and being in their general space is actually giving the bully more opportunities to um bully you uh physically so we don't want them to try and make friends with the bully um if the bully is around we want them to try and hang out with other teens because bullies are less likely to pick on teens uh, who are with people uh the greatest victims uh, of bullies and and this is why usually our teens with autism um are victimized is uh the teens who are hanging out by themselves so you know try and hang around with other teens if um other peers or you don't have friends around at the time straight stay near adults when the bully is around too so just kind of hover around uh where your teachers might be or the staff might might be when you see the bully is around and when these steps don't work that's when we want them to get help from an adult or if they are in real imminent danger they should be getting help from an adult and that could be parents that could be staff at school teachers uh but it's not sort of the first step we would recommend and we also always recommend that whenever they need to get help from an adult that it should be as discreetly as possible so that word doesn't get around to the bully that you know you told on them you um you know and that there were witnesses to you telling on them okay all right next moving on we're going to talk about cyber bullying so this is um bullying via um it it can also be via texting but most of the time it's you know social media um posting videos that the victim doesn't want posted um posting comments on things that the victim has posted online um all comprise of cyber bullying so what are most teens told to do in response to cyber bullying again for the most part they might be told ignore them delete the comment uh tell an adult let's go tell the authorities that sort of um um the um reaction that uh, also the advice that most teens get but what do most cyber bullies want their victims to do well they usually want a reaction most bullies whether it's teasing physical cyber bullying want a reaction and the reaction they are looking for is that their victim is upset um scared uh, bothered that is really that they got under their skin basically so cyber bullies usually want their victims to respond to the um, whatever comment or anything was posted about them so that they can continue attacking them um on social media so how to address cyber bullying so the first thing we want them to do is we tell them don't feed the trolls so just like the cyber bully wanted you to keep posting and keep reacting to the comments that they posted and it's very tempting to you know defend and um, argue and post back and things like that but that's what we call feeding the trolls you're giving them more and more opportunity to actually um, respond to you react back to you continue attacking you so we call them so we say don't feed the trolls so instead of you commenting on that it would actually be better if you had a friend stick up for you so you have a friend that reacts to that comment or post or whatever it was that the um, bully tried to uh, put online so that is usually helpful because again it's kind of the same principle like if the bully sees that you have friends that are supportive they're less likely to actually attack you um we also ask that our victims of on cyber bullying lay low online so just kind of keep a low profile don't post too many things you know um at once again that's just giving more opportunity for the bully to like see what you're posting react to it make fun of it or attack you so just at least for a period of time after you experience some cyber bullying lay low online other things that they can do is block the bully right so on things like facebook for example instagram you can block users from accessing your profile from seeing what you've posted okay you can also delete comments on some of these uh, apps and stuff so if there's something that you don't like you can just go ahead and delete it but what we do recommend is that they save the evidence before they delete anything okay so that means take a snapshot 
file it away. Um, you know, you can get help from supportive adults to do this if it's too upsetting for the teens to go on their profile themselves and see the comment or see the reaction. They can get an adult to like help them take a picture, file it away somewhere where they can't really see it all the time and then they can block the bully, the comment or whatever it is that they want to do. Um, and then we ask them, you know, again, if things really kind of don't stop with these steps, that's when they should be reporting cyberbullying to the right authorities. So that could include webmasters. So most of the social media apps have customer service, um, webmasters um, that will help with kind of, uh, you know, if they find that someone is um, getting complaints of being a cyber bully, they might actually delete their account and not give them access to that media anymore. Um, it could also be people at school, um, parents, right? Like people that can really, um, parents should probably facilitate this, but uh, schools now tend to have um, rules, steps, kind of consequences for cyberbullying. So if it is a cyberbully someone at school, um, there might be people at school that can address that. And then in extreme cases, we go to law enforcement. So we don't want to set up the habit of going to law enforcement just the first time it happens as you know, immediately or repeatedly, because then they're going to stop taking it too seriously, unfortunately. So we want to make sure that we reserve that step for most extreme cases, especially when these other steps don't work. And that's when the evidence that you saved is going to come handy, is when you are reporting cyberbullying to the authorities. Okay. Moving on, we'll now talk about the relational bullying steps. So this is handling rumors and gossip. So first we want to talk about how to avoid being the target of gossip. So this would include avoid being friends with the gossips. So again, you know, our teens might be in some misguided attempts trying to become friends with the gossips because they feel like, well, if I'm friends with them, then they're not going to uh, gossip about me. Again, that's not true because being friends with the gossips, now you actually, they actually have a lot more knowledge about your personal life and have more information on you that they can gossip about. We also don't them want them to be enemies with the gossips though. So don't try to like provoke them too much, become enemies with them because they're just going to keep, their mode of attack is going to be to spread further rumors and gossip about you. So we really want them to be neutral, as, as neutral as possible with the gossips. And we also want our teens not to spread rumors or gossip about other people. So not get stuck with the reputation of being a gossip themselves because what happens to gossips, other people tend to gossip about them too. So um, if your target is really to avoid being the source of gossip, then you probably want to not spread rumors and gossip yourself. Okay. So in this situation, what do most adults tell children and teens to do when they are the target of rumors and gossip? They might say, well, why don't you talk to your friend about what they said? Why don't you go confront them and ask them why they're saying this? A lot of times parents may intervene themselves, which, um, you know, again, you want to reserve that for when it's really, really serious rumors and gossip, but you want to have our teens try some of our suggested steps before that, uh, because that can, again, further provoke the gossip and uh, make our teens further victims of rumors and gossip. What is the natural response to someone spreading a rumor about you? Well, if everyone, everyone here I'm sure has had at some point a rumor or gossip spread about them, our most natural response is to defend ourselves in that situation, right? Is to try and explain as much as possible to as many people as possible that, oh, well, you know, that's actually not true or my point of view is this. And so let's see how that holds in terms of our steps here. So first, we're going to watch um, the bad role play in term, on handling rumors and gossip. So we're going to see what Alina does wrong in um, handling this gossip about herself. 
which is kind of like the natural response for most people. Oh my God, Allison, did you hear that rumor that I have a crush on James? Yeah, I did hear that. That is so not true. I mean, he's like not even my type at all. You know my type. It's like tall and dark hair. He's none of that. And we have no common interests. Like, it's, it's so not true. I mean, yeah, if you say so. Like, who would believe that? That's insane. I don't know. That's crazy. All right, so then we go into our questions again about firstly, what was uh, what did Alina do wrong in that situation? So most of our teens say, um, well, she looked really defensive. She looked really upset by that. Um, so then we ask, what was that like for the other person? Said, well, she kind of looked like she didn't really believe Alina, right? She looked like she was initially kind of supportive, but then as Alina became more and more defensive, she started to kind of question whether that had actually happened or not. What did she think of Alina? The most, uh, the like the majority response we get here is that she's like guilty of whatever the rumor is. Even if she is not actually guilty of the rumor, being defensive made her look guilty. And then we asked them, what would she believe the original rumor? They say probably because Alina, with all that guilt and defensiveness, again, didn't really, um, you know, do a good job in kind of dissuading her from that rumor. Okay. So what are the steps we want them to actually follow? What we say is every instinct we have is wrong, right? The instinct to actually disprove the gossip, to defend ourselves is actually wrong because it makes us look guilty always. Um, we want to sh them to show that they are not upset. Again, you know, in most of these teasing situations, we don't want to give our teasers or bullies the bullies the um, um, reaction that they want. Um, so try not to show that you're upset. We definitely don't want them to confront the source of gossip. Why is that? Because if they confront the source of gossip, the next gossip is going to be, oh, then did you know she or did you hear she went and she confronted her? That must mean she's guilty. That must mean that that rumor was true. We also, although don't want them to avoid the source of gossip. So this is kind of a no win situation. But what we mean by avoiding the source of gossip is like, um, you know, if they're in the same room, don't like avoid talking to the person or don't avoid making eye contact with the person because everyone's going to be watching you if you're in the same room with this gossip, right? So then the next source of a gossip, if you're avoiding them, is going to be that, oh, did you see they didn't even make eye contact? They didn't look at each other. It must mean that the original rumor was true. So what we really mean by avoid the source of gossip is if you know the gossip is going to be in a certain place or a certain party or a certain space on campus, just try to avoid those regions. So you're just not even in the same space as the gossip. So lay low sort of and plan your route. Then we want them to actually do something that most people would find surprising, which is we want them to actually act amazed. Anyone would believe or care about the gossip, right? So you just kind of being like, I, I can't even believe anyone would believe that or can you believe anyone even cares about that? So again, kind of giving that reaction of like, that's so lame. Why would anyone even care about that? Why would anyone even believe that? What that does is it makes the people that were engaging in the gossip or the rumor look really lame and look like, oh yeah, it looks really petty of me to be, um, and you know, kind of to care about this gossip about this other person. Then our final step is for them to actually spread the rumor about themselves. So the way we want them to do this is they need to first find an audience um, like um, between classes or in the cafeteria or wherever kids are hanging out, like between after school. Um, we want them to do this with a supportive friend. That's why it's always helpful to kind of have a supportive friend around, right? We want them to acknowledge the rumor with their friend. We don't want them to give too many details, just kind of a brief acknowledgement of the rumor. So did you hear this rumor that I have a crush on the math teacher? We don't want them to say, did you hear this rumor that I have a crush on the math teacher and that I went and gave him an apple for lunch today and then I always like sending him notes or something like that, okay? Just very brief. Um, finally, they need to act amazed 
that anyone would care and believe about that rumor, as we mentioned. So I can't even believe anyone believes that or people are so gullible. People need to get a life. People need to find something interesting to talk about. And then we want them to repeat that with other supportive friends. So the reason we need this to be done with a supportive friend is that your uh, and an audience is that so people hear you kind of acknowledge it. They hear you finding it lame. They, they see you not being bothered by it. And that then they're going to spread that rumor that, oh, you know, I don't really think that was true because she didn't really seem that bothered by it. And it's kind of actually really lame that we are even talking about this. Okay? So we want them to repeat this with other supportive friends if possible, with other audiences if possible, right? We don't want them to do with this multiple friends and the same audience because if it's the same audience listening to them do this multiple times, it's going to start to look like they do care about the rumor. Okay. So let's watch this last role play and see what Alina does right in handling this, uh, the rumor about her this time. So Allison, did you hear that rumor that I have a crush on James? Yeah, I did hear that. Like seriously, who would believe that? Seriously, I don't know. Like by the way, find something more interesting to talk about. I know, right? I mean, people need to get a life. Really? Like get a hobby or something. They really do. So lame. So. All right, and then we ask our perspective taking questions like what was that like for the uh, what did Alina do right in this situation? They'll say, well, she did all of it. She kept cool. She had a friend. We're assuming there's an audience watching her. Um, she didn't really look bothered. She acted pretty um, cool about it. Acknowledged the rumor very briefly and then gave a couple of um, comebacks that were like about it being like, unbelievable and why would people care about this people need to get a hobby people need to get a life okay so then we asked them what was that like for the other person they would say yeah normal you know she really didn't feel like uncomfortable like she might have the previous time what did she think of alina she thought alina was cool and collected um you know pretty calm about it and then would she believe the original rumor Probably not, because it really didn't seem to affect Alina that much, and she wasn't being defensive about it. So those are all our steps for handling the different kinds of rumors and gossip and types of bullying uh, and teasing. So finally, I just wanted to leave you guys again with this last page on our different resources. As I mentioned before, we have different manuals as well as phone apps that you can use to um, um, review all of the various steps that I covered today. There are, we also have a website that you can go on. That's the UCLA Pierce Clinic website. There's a tab on the website to look at all of our role play videos um, that, uh, for each of the different topics that we cover in our program. And you can contact us on this address that's right here or follow us on um, any of our social media accounts. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. So we've got a lot of questions today. Um, okay. The first question I've got is from parent, a parent who is asking, she was talking about the fact that Piers has a parent component. So she won wondered if you could share a little bit about what you teach mm -hmm. the parents about how to talk to kids about bullying and what the best strategies are. She said her teenager really takes it personally, as anyone would, and she really wants to help her understand what causes bullying. Right. So um, we do have a parent component to our program. What happens in the parent group is pretty much uh, you get the same didactic lesson as the teens get. So everything that I covered today would also be covered with the parents. And then the parents would go around and also talk about maybe specific situations that their teens find themselves in and how to talk to them about that. Um, that is a big question that we get is um, teens wondering why people are bullying them or teasing them. And it's really not something that, you know, we can, that there's no real one answer for that, right? Um, oftentimes, victims of teasing and bullying tend to do the same to other people. So there's all kinds of various backgrounds. Other times we find our teens are kind of doing some um, odd things that make them stand out and just become more victimized by their peers. Um, but most of the time, it's because they want to get, as we say, the main purpose of bullying is to get a reaction, right? And so that's really hard for some of our teens who've been victims to kind of change 
how they are approaching it. But that's the biggest piece is to not give the bullies or um, teasers the reaction that they're used to getting for them. And it, it, it will take a while. And that's why we have parents help with our program. So our parents will usually, because they also know the steps and such, practice that with their teens during the week. On you know, Like I said, tease them about their shoes or tease them about something they're wearing, like a T-shirt or something, and have them actually practice the comebacks and give them feedback about it. Okay, great. All right, here's a question. I think this person's actually looking for some tech support. It sounds like they use the FriendMaker app and they're looking right. for an update. Is there somebody they can reach out to who they, or is right. there a website they could visit? So, uh, yeah, I think that the uh, app is, with some of the new phones, it seems like it's getting glitchy. So we are looking into that with the publishers. But um, if you're having trouble with the app, go to our website and all of our role play videos are on our website. So you can just look at it through there. You don't need the app for that. Okay, yeah, I, I believe those are on YouTube. And we sent that link out earlier today. So in the reminder email, people can link out to that if they need to find them. Great. This next question, this person's asking, have you studied teens in different cities where there are different cultures? So is bullying different depending on where they are culturally? Or are the tendencies the same? That's great. Um, that's a great question. We actually haven't looked at that. We've looked at um, uh, bullying and teasing incidents in some of the different countries that are uh, working on adaptations of our program. So like in South Korea, in Japan, we have groups that are working on adapting this to that. So they are doing in-depth studies on like if the type of teasing, bullying, online bullying that happens in the United States also happens there and it varies like it's different in different uh, countries for sure culturally uh, but we haven't looked at that across cities in the US um, you know but I by I, my I would imagine that the purpose of bullying is the same everywhere right and what we're trying to target to uh, through our steps is to um, to address or you know not give them the uh, uh, the pleasure of whatever the purpose of their bullying or teasing behaviors are. So, right. So the motivation's similar. There may Most just be different similar. content to what they're bullying about. Okay. Right. Or different incidents. Some places might be more cyberbullying versus physical bullying and such. Okay. This person's asking. I know our examples today were about teenagers. They're asking about bullying programs for younger kids. And I, I know that you have uh, friendship programs and and other things available. Right. right, so the UCLA has a children's friendship program um, that is for ages uh, seven to 11. So it's uh, second to sixth grade and pretty much they teach the same steps for the bullying behaviors uh, to that age group. That's not an age group that tends to experience a lot of cyber bullying or rumors and gossip, but the teasing and bully, uh, physical bullying lessons that they get is the same as the one that I just talked about today as well as for young adults, it's pretty much the same. This next question is about IEPs. So mm -hmm. for a lot of parents trying to address bullying in the school, using the IEP can be one way to make sure that it's acknowledged, but it's always a delicate thing because there are two sides to the relationship between the bully and our, and our kids on the spectrum. So do you have any recommendations or suggestions for resources where parents can learn more about addressing bullying specifically in an IEP? Um, that to me would again be under the category of, you know, you take it to the school authorities when it has been severe. So um, an IEP could definitely include recognizing who a safe person would be at school for this um, for the for the child in question, right? Someone that they're comfortable with, someone that we like the parent knows has their back in those situations would be the ideal person to build into the IEP and um, have the team know that if you're in this kind of situation, this specific person is the one you should go address. I think that would really help a teen out knowing who exactly to go approach at school if they find themselves in this situation. Uh, a few IEPs at in the LA uh, school district have actually paid for people to come do the UCLA peers program. So if they have been victims of bullying or teasing or other kind of social rejection, um, and if that's built into the IEP that like the school district needs to address that, then they've basically paid for them to come 
do our program, learn the skills to handle some of that. Okay. So that could okay. be an option too. Okay. So this person's asking, um, and I know a lot of our families experience this. Most of the examples here were for higher functioning kids. So people with very uh, strong verbal communication skills. So for people right. who have, have different verbal communication skills or limitations, do you right. address that or are there strategies that those families might seek out? Unfortunately, we don't currently. So this is a program for high functioning individuals um, on the spectrum. We are currently working on developing a program for uh, lower functioning individuals or um, more or less verbal um, kids. So in the future, we are hoping to have that through our program. Uh, but right now, I don't have a good sense of, you know, specific skills or advice for that. Okay. This person's talking about a child who, you talked about this right off the bat. You talked about the fact that overreacting is the most common reaction for most kids mm -hmm. on the spectrum and even for typical people reacting directly mm -hmm. to the bully. So are there steps that you teach as part of the program for that self-regulation? Are there things that, that you teach that help them, you know, count to 10 or are there different things that you give them as, do as mm -hmm. tools? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talk more individually to kids who have, who have that kind of difficulty. Um, it's not, we actually don't want them to count to 10 because that if they're standing in the situation counting to 10, again, it's going to seem a little odd and weird and the teaser is going to tease them about it. So um, what we have them do is more um, uh, surreptitious kind of steps of like deep breathing or counting to 10 could be done, but like in your mind's eye sort of, and that's something we have them practice with their parents during the week. Um, before they find themselves in a situation where they have to actually use that. So the key really is practice, 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 right? So parents are a great source to practice with. Um, siblings are actually a great source to be the teasers because that can naturally happen between siblings anyway. Um, so they could practice actually using um, the steps that we talk about and also kind of, you know, how to keep cool and not look bothered with siblings or parents at home. Okay. This question is about how trying to detect exactly what's attracting a bully to a student. So I guess the big question is, does it matter? <laughs> I mean, do we need to figure that out? Or, or is that really important to do a right. behavioral analysis and identify that? Right. Sometimes it does matter. Because as I said, sometimes kids are getting victimized because of nothing they're doing. Um, but other times they might be doing things that, you know, that is, uh, that bullies are picking up on. So, um, what some of the things we get are things like personal hygiene, for example, um, you know, can be a big target, um, for bullies or, um, unfortunately if our kids have ticks or so, then that's something that, you know, can also be make them victims of bullying. So it's, it depends on what that is, but yeah, you do have to do her behavioral analysis. So for example, if it was ticks or like if someone had Tourette syndrome and that was causing them to be victimized by their peers, you would have to have them do treatment for the ticks so that they're not engaging in that as much for all of these steps to actually be more effective, right? Other times, if it's more related to what the person is doing, like if it's personal hygiene or if they're talking out of turn or if they are like cracking bad jokes all the time, that's something that we call um, in, we have a lesson on bad reputations in our uh, curriculum. And that's addressing that sometimes there might be things you're doing that uh, people are actually giving you feedback on through their teasing or bullying. So if you're getting constantly teased about dandruff, then there are things you can do about that. So um, again, if the, we, you know, sometimes parents will just pull us aside and talk about like, well, yeah, they're always getting teased about their bad breath then we kind of have a side conversation with the teen about why that's important to change and what they can do to change that um, if they are interested. Okay, great. Well, the last question, I know you talked about this at the very beginning, but it came up again, so I wanted to run it by you. People are asking about how they can find peers resources in their regions. So where right. can they go on your site to learn more about that? Right. So if you go on our site, there's a tab called Peer Certified Providers. 
so if you go under that it uh, all of the people that we've trained over the years who've done our workshops have officially gotten certified in the peers program are listed on that page and it is divided up by state um so you can find for your state maybe even your city depending on the state who who the um uh, peer certified providers are Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. We're going to have you back next month for one more webinar. So for everybody who's still here, uh, be sure to mark your calendars and also check our website for other great webinars we have coming up. That's online at ariconference.com. Thanks so much. Awesome.